Hello people of the internet, it's Amanda and for today's video I'm here to talk about a film that I actually just finished watching on Amazon Prime. It's available there internationally. I'm talking about Gekijo starring Yamazaki Kento and Mato Kamayu. Now this film has been much anticipated ever since a trailer was put out mainly because of again the headlining actors and at the same time I feel like a lot of people similar to me are just interested to see how Yamazaki Kento will play such a mature and adult type of character. Now he has other projects in his filmography but obviously he's more known for like very shoujo, live action, anime-ish type of titles. So for me that's where the main curiosity is at. Now I know that a lot of J-drama peeps are very particular about him like they either hate him or like him but to me it really just depends on whatever work he puts out there I don't have a lot of opinions <laughs> I've said this in my previous videos before but um and him being paired with Mayu now Mayu I absolutely love from Chihaya Furu from Tremble All You Want from Shoplifters so it's definitely an interesting duo to see and I don't know I'm just when they saw the trailer, I was like, okay, so this seems very interesting. There's still a bit of iffiness, mainly because I'm not really into melodramas. Like, I rarely watch melodramas, but if there's a very interesting plot surrounding it, that that's only when I dig deep into it. I think it's mainly because of the fact that I'm a crybaby. That's why I steer clear from these types of narratives. But anyway, there are going to be a lot of spoilers for this particular talk through video. I just to put it out there. King knew if you're a fan, so they also have some bits or cameos in this particular movie. So just putting it out there. But for the intents and purposes of this video, I would just be focusing on the dynamic of the two main characters your game to just talk about it chat it up then please keep on watching before i dive deep into the themes of the film and the metaphors that i sort of like observed from this or maybe read into it too much i don't know let's just focus on the plot first so the story revolves around yamazaki kento's character nagata who is a struggling playwright and he is also a co-founder of this very unsuccessful theater troupe that he has with his friend and the thing of this is he is the type of character who um who has a lot of opinions about certain works or how people do this thing that he also does in the industry but at the same time his difference from like this specific trope that we've often seen in films is for others they usually think of themselves as geniuses and that other people just don't understand their genius but for him he's really more of just you know doing these things in his own accord but recognizing that maybe he's not really good enough and that that's why other people don't see him as good enough and it's just boiling down to all of these insecurities and bleakness and just as the one of the most repeated lines in the film how long will i last that question is sort of like questioning how long can you keep on living this life of just monotony um and that's basically one of like the biggest themes or the the biggest like character arcs in this entire narrative um he then meets um the very bright character of matsuo kamayu huisaki and from there like he tries to pursue her as soon as he sees her you know admiring the same work as him in shibuya art gallery it's definitely creepy and awkward how he tries to sort of like ask her out repeatedly telling her that they're wearing the same shoes she's obviously uncomfortable by the entire thing but then eventually you know she gives up and um, treats her treats him to a drink and then their story starts off from there now right off the bat that's a massive red flag <laughs> and the thing with this narrative is initially i thought it was going to romanticize how toxic relationships work but as the story progresses and the way that nagata's character is painfully self-aware as he's narrating the story adds grittiness to the plot and how it recognizes that this is a toxic relationship that this isn't a healthy relationship at all and that it it shows it to us in a very realistic adaptable somehow even relatable maybe to some people um 
and it's so painful to watch because I feel like if you're the type of viewer somehow sees yourself in the characters that you're watching, this is something that can hit close to home to a lot of viewers. Um, and I will be exploring more on that later. But the main theme of this is that they started, you know, having this relationship where it's almost like, Nagata's character is very codependent on Saki's character um, and the juxtaposition of their personalities made him bitter because it's, it emphasized his own ugliness and he recognized them him, he recognized it himself um, as he was narrating the story. There's the motorcycle scene where it's I feel like is a metaphor for the relationship or how toxic relationships are where you just go in circles and circles and circles. One person is spiraling into their own demise and the other person is trying to understand and to see, still see the good in this other person. But then in the end, it gets very tiring and exhaustive for the other person until it ends and you fall out of love. I feel like that scene in itself is a metaphor or a foreshadowing as to how the story of the two characters would go on as the story um, progresses. Um, and what I like about that is after that particular scene, you know, they were talking in this small apartment that they call their safe place. And, um, Saki was complaining for the first time in a lot of like whatever happened to them in the beginning, she started complaining as to, you know, how she was so afraid of the dark hiding just to amuse him, you know, just to show up every time he goes and round about in a circle, but then he keeps on ignoring her. And that made her feel very scared. Like it's so insensitive of him to do that. But then Nagata points out, but you chose to hide, didn't you? And it was sort of like this dynamic of her him and her choosing each other and them choosing each other despite the circumstances that they're in and that's what makes their relationship as toxic as it is um and again as i mentioned because of the movie self-awareness and how it tries to repeat itself to the viewers it doesn't paint this as a romantic relationship but rather a relationship that's full of like pain and toxicity and how they're not good for each other but they're trying to hold on to each other because they're each other's safety pins um which is what toxic relationships are and i like how the side characters are also making it a point to remind the viewers as well as the characters themselves that you know people are seeing that your relationship is not good at all <laughs> like it keeps on reminding us that this type of parasitic dynamic is not good for both members of the relationship and it's very i like how they also represented it in the way saki is um dressing so initially when they were just starting out she was wearing a lot of very colorful clothes um she has like this very nice colored hair but then as they're um, their relationship progresses and she starts to get seeped into the negativity that is Nagata. She, uh, even her clothes, you know, she started dressing darker. Um, she, her hair grows longer. It's no longer colored and stuff like that. Um, that very subtle detail and the change in their dynamic, like the comfort between the two of them until she starts to not, uh, she starts to be wary of their relationship. She gets um, ex she started to get exhausted of of this back and forth that they have that they're not going anywhere that they're stagnant in a way um, and it's shown through the character of uh, Matsuoka Mayu brilliantly but very subtly in the narrative um, it's also it's also quite interesting because another relatable aspect of Yamazaki Kento's character, despite the fact that you would probably hate him watching this because of how negative and just like a freather like his character is, but at the same time, I feel like there are some aspects of our own struggles and personalities and insecurities can relate to his character. Um, there's this one arc there where a similar um, playwright was making very successful narratives are being recognized and then he he had to face his own insecurities because he was moved by one of the one of his one of that playwright's um, plays, 
and he he had this thought where you know how people of the same age like if they're doing a lot better than you then it sparks this sort of like hatred within yourself or burden that would manifest as if you were just trying to be prideful or arrogant towards the other person but it's really more of like how you hate yourself because how come you can't be that person and i guess these very relatable and slap in the face type of themes in this film make it effective in a way for me at least um like it's dramatic but at the same time it it still allows the viewers to see themselves into the characters that are playing off on in on screen. Oh, one of the scenes where I started crying <laughs> was the scene where he went after Saki when she went to her manager's house. And then it was like he was desperate to keep the relationship together that he started telling her things that he should have told her before because she complained earlier on that he didn't even compliment her ever throughout the span of the relationship. So, so he started telling her what she actually means to him in his life um, for the first time in their relationship. And it was shown that they were wearing the same shoes. And it was just a very like subtle moment of them riding on a bicycle under cherry blossoms. But in a, it's not bright. It's very much reflective of their relationship. It was nighttime, so there were only the ones there. It was a very serene but sad and bittersweet type of moment because it was them sort of like trying to repair their relationship. And it was like showing that they were wearing the same shoes. It was very similar to the dynamic of how they first met. Like it was like they were trying to walk on the same pace again as each other. And that's, I mean, it was a, they weren't even making that obvious. Like he was just trying to talk to her about what she means to his life and how, what he thinks of her when they first met. But I started bawling my eyes out <laughs> on that particular scene because of all these thoughts that um, was going through my head as to what that symbolizes for the relationship it was them trying to keep it together but then starting to realize that they're not good for each other after that you know they sort of like this their relationship sort of started to improve after that but then eventually i think as the story is trying to say this type of relationship catches up to you and this movie shows that there, there's only so much you can endure for another person out of love. And just because you can't endure it anymore doesn't necessarily mean that your love isn't true. But sometimes it just gets so exhaustive and tiring and that's the reality of it. Um, it shows us how people can change and not change. It shows that the fact that toxic relationships and how it hurts people long before they even realize it can take a toll later on from both the people involved and the individual as well. Um, and to me, that very raw message is what made this very beautiful, despite how dramatic it is, is because it's something that is recognizable to a lot of people, that is relatable and recognizable to a lot of people. After they started to sort of get better, where Saki claims that, you know, Maybe Tokyo is too much for her. She has to go back to her hometown, stuff like that. So she left that safe place of theirs to to find herself again in her hometown. And um, what's interesting to me is that she comes back one night, just for one night, and they start talking about that play that they did so many years before. The relationship was just, was just starting out. Um, and they started repeating the lines that were in, in the in the script, and then they started going off script, um, and it seemed more of like their confessions as to how their relationship should have been like. They started recognizing how they're maybe better off fixing each other apart, and how maybe they. Sh it's inevitable for this to happen like they still love each other but they have to go their separate ways to heal and just when you think that they're finally like everything is starting to make sense now that they're finally starting to learn from what other people are trying to tell them and they're about their relationship in the first place ever since the beginning walls started breaking down and then the scene transforms into a play 
just like how this entire thing is of it's being fed to us throughout the narrative where the cinematography you know whenever it shifts it blacks out similar to how theaters are like when they're ch trying to change scenes or acts um the way that the lines are being repeated or there's a narrator it somehow concludes in that particular final moment of the film where the walls start falling down and then here's Nagata's character talking to Saki but she's a different person altogether and it's just a play and we see Matsuoka Mayu in the audience sort of like replying subtly in her own way to the lines that were being delivered by Nagata and we sort of question did that scene actually happen in real life? Was that moment between Nagata and Saki something that really happened when she came back to Tokyo for one night? Did they even have that conversation? Or was it something that Naga it was a result of Nagata's wishful thinking? He wrote it into a script and made it into display. And now Saki, the real Saki, is watching in the audience and hearing it for the first time as if it was a confession or a way to, to close things or I don't know. Um, it's definitely unclear whether they really de did see each other after she left whether their conversation was just wishful thinking on Nagata's part or whether or not she was really in the audience at all. Um, it was even like it, it even ma made me question whether the entire thing that we're watching, the entire span of the film was actually like, was it even real? Like, were, were they even a couple really? Was this the entire play inspired by their own story or was it just a manifestation of this theater play all along? It quest it made ra it raised a lot of questions, and the film is about to conclude at this point. So it reminded me of that scene where they were doing the play Sonohi in the beginning, and Yamasaki Kenta's character instructs Mayu Matoka Mayu's character to look into the audience as if she was talking to someone who hates her. It was it goes full circle to this particular scene where he was addressing the audience and she was there, she was crying. And it wasn't clear whether or not the play was actually addressed to her or she was just part of the audience who was moved by the entire narrative. And that's how it ended. And um everything like as soon as the credits start rolling, you know, people are leaving leaving the play and then Matoka Mayu's character just remains there. And then she stands up from her seat when everybody else is left. And then she takes one last look at the stage and then she leaves. And it will make you think like, so, so what was that conclusion? Was there really a Nagata in Saki? Or was this all a play? But in the end, it told us a story that is very true, that very raw, that hits close to home in a way and just ends up in that conclusion as to whether or not like how we're going to perceive it or take it as an audience and to me i think that was brilliant um no matter how dramatic or no matter how many times i cried <laughs> in the first parts of the film i think what really sealed the deal for me was that ending scene as soon as the wall started unraveling when Saki and Nagata started talking about all these idealistic things about their relationship and yeah and I don't know I mean I guess to me what I like the most about this is again one some of the themes I feel like is relatable to people whether it's about relationships just you or having this person, you know, wanting to be your safety pin, but at the same time, you know, you know how much you're becoming a burden to them, but you can't let them go, which is what toxic relationships are and can be, but can also be what just relationships in general are like. Um, and it definitely explores that in a very slap in the face type of manner. Um, and yeah, I mean, I feel like I've said this over and over, but that final scene really did it for me. Um, would I recommend this film? Absolutely. But I do feel like if you're not really into melodramas, then this might feel like a very slow, draggy type of film for you. But if you're in it, I don't know if people cried or 
are going to cry if they see this, but I did many times, sadly. Um, but yeah, with that said, are you going to see this film? Have you seen this film? What are your thoughts on this film? I feel like that there are definitely a lot of metaphors here that are really interesting to explore if you're into film, which I did a bad job of doing. But overall, I do recommend this film if you love very dramatic, very very profound narratives i guess that tugs at, at the heart and obviously like if you like either of the actors it's also something that's very interesting to watch so with that if you like this video please give it a thumbs up if you're new to my channel and you would want to hear more from me please hit subscribe thank you so much for watching this i hope that i made sense because i don't think i did but anyways thank you so much for watching i hope to see you again soon in a new video bye